Assalamu alaikum and peace. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and you're watching Muslim Network TV. We are 24 seven, uh, always available uh, on Galaxy 19 satellite, which covers United States, Canada, and Mexico, east to west, north to south, uh, 57 million subscribers, mostly in the rural areas. We are also on OTT devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and you can uh, also stream our signal on your smartphone. So download our app on Muslim Network TV, Muslim Network TV, on your uh, iPhone or Android, and you will be able to stream. Or you can go on our website always, Muslim Network TV. Uh, today we'll be talking about something which uh, uh, is far away from here, but close to home. I mean, on Christmas Day, Christmas, Christmas bomber uh, terrorized the whole Nashville, except that nobody is calling it a terrorism. They're calling it a, uh, you know, intentional bombing. It's such a nice name right there. And his name is being mentioned. He was a nice guy. Neighbors are saying and all that. And uh, he terrorized the whole thing, 40 bing buildings and AT&T network in three, four states uh, got messed up. 30 plus 9-11 uh, centers uh, could not receive calls and uh, emergency information was all destroyed. Close to home, but no Muslim name was attached. Uh, as a result, it's not a headline anymore. It's already a very small news somewhere. Some guy did something. At the same time, of course, a soldier, active duty soldiers killed three people, injured other three on the Christmas day. Somebody killed uh, five family members. None of that is a news, but God forbid, if any of these three incident, there was any name of Islam and Muslim, you will be watching it 24 seven on the national media. So terrorism, war and Islamophobia is a connected cycle and it's a connect killing cycle. War kills, terrorism kills and Islamophobia dehumanizes people before it kills them all around the world. But we'll be talking about this killing cycle somewhere far away from America and Canada in South Asia, on October 15, 2014, I'm a subscriber of a New York Times and there was an editorial there, October 15, 2014, that was six years ago. And its heading was Deadly Alliances Against Muslims. Deadly Alliances Against Muslims. I said they're talking about New York Times and interested about talking about Palestine in that way. I looked up, no. It was talking about Sri Lanka, India, and Burma. The whole editorial was that Buddhist extremists and Hindu extremists are aligning with each other uh, and collaborating against the Muslim communities who are minorities in all these three countries. Of course, by now we know uh, that Burma has committed genocide against Rohingya people who are indigenous people of Burma living in their ancestral lands and they are essentially wiped out. And in Sri Lanka, uh, now it has got into this cycle of war, terrorism and hate. Uh, it was aimed at uh, Hindu minorities of Tamil speaking people. Now it is fully aimed at the Muslim community. And in India, as we know pretty well, uh, Muslim get lynched in the broad daylight, just good old Southern way of in America and hanged from the tree and beaten up on the street. And police, even if it's prison, instead of stopping it also participate. Well documented, extremely well documented. So all essentially all three countries, Burma, India and Sri Lanka have governments which are directly anti-Muslim government. They speak against that, their individual and the leadership has been implicated in massacres and things like that. And it's a well-known fact, Indian government and streets are under the control of RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, uh, which was much known for killing Gandhi. 
and uh, they control the street, they control the government and all the departments is happening there. Now, unfortunately, same thing is happening in Sri Lanka where Muslim by law are required to cremate their bodies, their dead bodies against their religious practices. So in India, they started this thing called covid jihad they call it that muslims actually are responsible for pandemic similar thing they were putting on sri lankan muslim and uh, prominent muslim leaders arrested detained in preventive terrorism act without any judicial process sri lanka you know is a beautiful country i have met many people i have friends there i love to go there one of these places it has a very vibrant multi-religious society, multi-ethnic society. Of course, 70% of them are Buddhist and uh, Sinhalese, but it was a beautiful place. Um, it's uh, it's an uh, Indian Ocean, southwest of the Bay of Bengal and southeast of Arabian Sea. It is uh, far higher educated than uh, India or Burma. They live uh, eight years higher than Indians. So what has gone wrong there? Why the Sri Lankan government has taken the flag of Islamophobia and going after the Muslim community? To discuss all of that with us, focus on Sri Lanka. Uh, we have uh, people from three different places, actually three from three different continent. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sarekbal Sakrani, Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, uh, Imam Malik. Thank you for having me. Sir Iqbal Satrani is a senior advisor now to Muslim Council of Britain, which he was among the founders. And because of his contribution and bringing Muslims together and working broader in the society, is honored by whatever is the British uh, system of uh, honoring someone with the title of Sir. sir. And uh, we also have with us a Faris Hussain. So, so, Faris, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Okay, Faris Hussain is a, a co-founder of Charlotte D House, and he's a Sri Lankan Muslim. Has been in America for twenty plus years. He's from joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Sir Iqbal Sakrani was jo is joining us from London, UK. So, why are they cremating Muslims, uh, Sir Iqbal Sakrani? What is what has gone wrong there? Well, if we go back to I think March of this year, uh, twenty twenty, um, in in light of the COVID crisis around the world, um, somehow a health committee within the Sri Lankan government. Um, came across with this sort of rather weird sort of um, a proposition that um, um, by burying, carrying out a burial on COVID um, uh, victims, uh, there's a, 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 a threat of the virus spreading from the dead body into the water system. And uh, because Sri Lanka has got a, um, I think the water levels seem to be quite high, um, that was a, a, a sort of a, um, a, a verdict given by the health committee, which went to the government, I believe, and the government took a clear directive on that basis that anybody who dies from COVID um, would need to be cremated. Now, of course, um, if the information that was provided by the health committee was of authentic nature, some reliable, then one could give some sort of understanding to the matter. but. Immediately, the World Health Organization, um, along with other uh, international virologists, scientists, immediately came up and said, there is no such evidence available where any possible threat exists for the virus to spread in the dead bodies. In fact, uh, within three days, the virus actually disappears from the dead body. And, um, and throughout the world, throughout the world where the COVID is spread, not a single country has taken this action. So it was deeply disturbing that Sri Lanka, out of somewhere, came up with, with this decision to cremate bodies, which of course included Muslims, Christians and Jews, the Abrahamic faith, who clearly have a very um, uh, uh, understanding of the faith, that the, people, the deceased people need to be buried. So when this news came to us, of course, initially it was unbelievable that this is actually taking place. 
but our friends and um, uh, in, in Sri Lanka from the legal fraternity to the community all came up and said, well, this is of disturbing nature, but they are falling through the process and hopefully will reverse the decision because it's somehow uh, a person within the health committee who I believe even within the health committee that has um, uh, given this sort of verdict, there isn't a senior virologist or scientist who specializes in such matter. And they have been questioning, could we have the evidence available that can be studied? But until now, I believe no such evidence has been presented. So the, the community in Sri Lanka did everything possible through the government um, to try and sort of convince them. Of course, uh, we have got Muslims in the parliament and the opposition as well and people of other faith. Uh, they did everything. They met the president, the prime minister, the ministers and all that. But sadly, nothing had come through. So then they had to follow through the legal recourse, which was to challenge into the, the court system and see if some sort of um, a change of um, uh, opinion can take place. Uh, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court was closed for months during the last uh, few months. And then finally, uh, 10 days ago, the Supreme Court did actually hear the petition from the, I think there were eight or 10 applicants of which some were Christians and some were Muslims. And um, they actually rejected the petition. Um, they were not able to give the reasoning behind it as well, or justif to justify this particular reasons on the health or medical grounds, which the initial health committee had done. And, um, and that came as a shock. So of course, um, the, the uh, community were in touch with organizations like us in the, in, in the UK through the Muslim Council of Britain. And we felt the situation was of such serious nature that we had to create a special task force headed by the assistant secretary general, along with the senior legal people in the country, medical experts, media uh, personnel, and of course, community activists to see what can be done. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Alhamdulillah, um, the MCB has now, um, uh, for the first time in its history over 30 years, has now embarked on a major legal action through the UN um, um, uh, uh, Commission of Human Rights, where um, they're seeking to establish a tribunal uh, at the international level to look into this crisis uh, that is taking place in Sri Lanka. Because until now, uh, we are hearing some vibes that uh, the government is considering uh, for some uh, dry land where the burial could take place and um, various other me measures are being considered, but nothing has as yet uh, taken place on a concrete level where it could give the assurances to our community in Sri Lanka and of course Muslim worldwide that this matter will be will be sort of um, uh, uh, you know ended in a, in a nice amicable manner but one thing with uh, Imam Malik which is very very crucial that I believe until today more than 80 to 90 Muslims have been cremated uh, against their will against their sort of um, consent which is really required including um, recently a 20 day old baby where both the parents were tested negative. And if you hear the, the background in terms of how the baby was kept in the hospital without parents being seeing it, and then when, and without their consent, the baby was also, also cremated. So that family, I believe um, uh, last week has petitioned the Supreme Court uh, to and seek for the full bench the, I believe it is seven um, uh, or seven people on the the, the the most senior judges to sit onto it and um, uh, you know uh, look into this whole case and hopefully review and come to senses that this matter which goes against all the international principles of legality against the human rights conventions whether it's the European UN or other conventions around the world and of course the Amnesty International. Um, other human rights organizations around the world have all issued very powerful statements condemning the action which seem to be of a political nature rather than any grounds of medical or health otherwise. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> another guest joining straight from Colombo, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Hilmi Ahmad. Well, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Hilmi Ahmad is Vice President of Muslim Council of Sri Lanka. The Muslim Council of Sri Lanka is an umbrella organization for over 60 Muslim civil society organizations. Um, as uh, far as you have been listening to this conversation, 
I mean, cremation is a Buddhist practice. Uh, they do that, and I, I probably they don't realize the how Muslims see it. Of course, the dead person, when that person is dead, probably that person does not feel anything of that. But the type of trauma, because in Islam, you know, you know, anything like that is unimaginable. I think the psychological trauma is probably way bigger uh, in this particular one. Do you see its element of the Buddhist Islamophobia in there when they're insisting without any scientific evidence uh, that Muslim must cremate their bodies, even those who are tested negative? So is it is it some sort of a game like that? Yeah, definitely. There is a you know, huge Islamophobia, being a propaganda being uh, in the news and everywhere else, you know, around uh, the Muslim community as the villain. They, they make it to look like, look, this is a Muslims are the problems here. And mostly it is a political game, I think, in overall. Uh, Muslims have been used uh, during the election time, you know, with the Easter bombing and everything else. And I think right now they're using uh, COVID to, to portray Muslim as, as a problem in the country. Uh, this is definitely to, to uh, make a propaganda for the, the, the present government, right? And, and Muslims are paying the price for it. And for example, um, uh, Dr. Sarkani mentioned about the 20 year old, 20 day old child and where there is no, uh, the, the, none of the tests were positive for the parents and only the baby was uh, told they were positive and they cremated without being able to be seen. So it is, creates a lot of psychological issues for the community. Um, so definitely the Muslim community is paying the price for it. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking to Dr. Uh, Sarikbal Sakrani, Hilmi Ahmed, and Faraz Hussain. We'll be right back after these messages. Hello. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking about Sri Lanka. 
um, but Hilmi Ahmad, how many Muslims are there and what is the total population of Sri Lanka and what is the proportion of Muslims there? Uh, we are about 22 million people uh, in Sri Lanka and out of that uh, about 2 million are Muslims, approximately 10%. And uh, Muslims have been in Sri Lanka for 1,200 years and they have been an integral part of the, the country uh, for centuries. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, see, we seem to be looked upon as an alien community uh, during the last uh, decade or so. Hmm. So, uh, you know, so you're saying that the relationship between Muslim and Buddhist was not that way uh, 10 years ago. Uh, you see, a uh, little bit of historical background. You see, Sri Lanka has gone through uh, 30 years of uh, armed conflict with the Tamil people of this country. During that time, uh, the Muslims uh, who also lived in the north and east in large uh, uh, numbers did not uh, side with the uh, liberation tigers of Tamil Elam. And uh, they supported, uh, or they, they were with the Sri Lankan government. And until that time, you know, the Muslims were uh, a preferred minority because uh, they were seen as being uh, patriotic to the country. And lots of uh, the intelligence officers in the Sri Lankan army were uh, Muslims because they are trilingual. This is Muslims are the only people who are trilingual in Sri Lanka. And so they were seen, and uh, during the entire 30-year uh, uh, war period, uh, we, we, we had no major problems. Of course, we have had minor uh, uh, problems at the village levels where between Buddhists and Sinhalese, but nothing uh, which uh, caused us any concern. But, you know, with the end of the war in uh, 2009, uh, the euphoria of that war victory uh, made uh, some extremist Buddhists to think that they have finished off one minority, they could finish off the other minority. And the, the hate campaign against the Muslims started in 2009, or full-blown uh, hate campaign started in 2009. First, uh, they wanted... Uh, to give up uh, halal or halal certification uh, of our foods. Uh, and then it went on for uh, quite a long time. And uh, then later, one by one, uh, they were intimidating Muslims all over. Uh, they wouldn't uh, admit uh, Muslim children uh, to national schools. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it caused a lot of problems for the Muslims. The Muslims started moving away from government education. They started setting up their own private schools and Muslims went uh, into those schools in large numbers. The fallout of this whole or the tragedy of it is that they had absolutely no interaction with other communities. Right? The school children grew up without having a single uh, friend from any of the other communities. So there, the polarization uh, was in a way promoted by the government because you know they felt that you know we, they, they, we, they don't need us. And in business, in everything, uh, Muslims were harassed. So it's a long history and- uh, But I was quite, uh, you know, concerned of hearing that uh, Muslim were not allowed to get into the government school system. Uh, was it yes. a written government policy or they will be just discriminating against them? No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an unwritten policy, but there were a few schools which uh, actually issued letters saying that they don't admit Muslims. And we have been trying very hard to convince the parents that you know they must cooperate with us to take legal action against the school. But, you know, they were very reluctant because, you see, uh, they felt 
whatever schools the children have to go, they will be discriminated if there was a public uh, uh, noise about this uh, particular thing. So we were never able to challenge them in court. Uh, but, I, you know, in fact, uh, last year, uh, I got uh, a parent to make an application to a particular school. I, uh, of course, he didn't have, uh, you know, the ch child was already admitted to another school. But I got, made the application hoping that, uh, that uh, uh, they would send a rejection letter so that we can take legal action. But unfortunately, they didn't respond to that. Uh, this thing, they, they sent, just sent a letter that the child is overage uh, to enter that class because he was already uh, in school in grade one or two, I can't remember. Right, so they sent a letter saying that uh, he's overage to be admitted. So to tell us, the you know, the case which was rejected on cremation by the Supreme Court, yeah. uh, it was a uh, one-person bench or it was a larger bench? No, I was, I was one of the petitioners uh, for it. And actually, we were the first to embark on that petition. Uh, it was a three-bench judge. And they kept on postponing. Uh, and then when they started uh, uh, the case, uh, uh, one of the defense lawyers uh, was in quarantine. So again, they had to uh, postpone it. And uh, of course, it was only by a few days. And then when they started it, they heard the case for one and a half uh, days. The submissions were made. And suddenly, uh, they said uh, they have made the decision uh, and that it's a two to one uh, decision. It was a dissenting uh, decision and uh, that uh, they will not allow leave to proceed. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, they have no, no necessity to give uh, any reason for their rejection. But they said it's a two to one dissension. And no. two to one Tell us this. I mean, uh, you know, once a person is dead, you bury them. And there is a particular religious freedom issue that how you bury your dead. I mean, it's a, a rite of passage. It is a deeply thing. But it also has element of uh, uh, Islamic belief that other than God, no one is a th no one can punish anyone uh, through burning them. I mean, it seems to be pretty traumatic. Uh, so, how the individuals who loved ones have been uh, uh, cremated forcefully, how they are coping with this particular trauma of they could not handle and bury their people according to the Islamic tradition. It's it's very traumatic, and uh, but also uh, it causes uh, pain uh, to the entire family and the community. You see, uh, a dead person has no obligation uh, to see how he's uh, buried or cremated or whatever thrown to the vultures. Even, but you know, the living, living have that responsibility to give that. Uh, Muslim brother or sister a decent Islamic funeral and so it's incumbent not just on the family but the entire Muslim community to ensure that so that is why you know from March uh, this year we have been doing everything humanly possible uh, to convince the government that uh, you know we need our religious right uh, to be uh, performed on the janazas and we gave them a lot of concessions right we told them that uh, uh, we don't need to wash the body we don't need to shroud them in white cloth right we said we are free to uh, put them in sealed body bags and coffin you bring them up to the muslim graveyard we will say a <coughs> prayer uh, to the dead right uh, janaza prayers from 50 meters away from the body, the authorities or the health workers or whoever can do the burying themselves. Right? Mm. Uh, they didn't accept that. So then we went up to them. Then we went up to them and said, "Okay, if you fear that you know this could contaminate groundwater, 
right? We designed a concrete coffin, a complete uh, concrete coffin, fully sealed. Said, okay, and that coffin uh, is uh, about uh, three feet in height and normal size of a uh, grave, right? And we, we said we will put uh, one and a half feet of earth into it and lay the body. And then we, we would need to uh, uh, introduce some chemical for the plastic uh, body bag uh, to disintegrate. But for, we, we, we had given them all these concessions and the government refused. So you have given option after option after option which are being rejected. Uh, Forrest, tell me this. Um, you know, in India, uh, as pandemic gained, yeah. they started blaming Muslims that Muslims are responsible for the spread of pandemic there. Was uh, before this cremation ban, uh, cremation of forced cremation of Muslim bodies, uh, even those who were uh, not uh, positive for, uh, for COVID-19, was there a campaign which began parallel to it? Because the New York Times, in, uh, uh, you know, editorial which I referred to, it talks about the Burmese. Uh, Buddhist, Sri Lankan Buddhist, and Indian Hindus extremely <coughs> meeting and collaborating against each other. So was there a similar campaign against Muslim uh, when the pandemic began? And how this Islamophobia got into this picture? I think the Islamophobia got into the picture. And there is definitely a parallel between what's happened in Myanmar, in India, and in Sri Lanka. Right. Um, so there is also a lot of elements that working with these groups to create the same scenarios, but they created in Burma and India. I think they're doing the same thing in Sri Lanka at this point. What they want to do is to, to portray this is as a, more of a, a Muslim created problem than, than what it is. Right. Um, there are more people have became subject matter expert than actual subject matter experts on the issue. Like if you look at, uh, there are some uh, Buddhist monks, they were doing protests last couple of days and I saw it on TV and they were extremely against uh, burial. They, they were saying that you know, it could create issues uh, in the long term and therefore you know, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, all the subject matter experts uh, in the field um, in a non virologist all the other countries, developed countries, everybody else is doing the burial. Right. So it is really targeted towards Muslim in Sri Lanka to, to, to show that this is you know, something that uh, they're targeted towards the Muslim community in Sri Lanka. Hmm. Dr. Sarekpal Sakrani, I mean, in Burma, uh, in Burma, uh, you know, it is known that judiciary is of no use. And in India, you know, people have realized gradually that judiciary is not impartial. In Delhi right early this year, when a judge issued a stay order and asked to hear uh, attacks on Muslim to be stopped and police should be stopped, uh, uh, from attacking Muslims, uh, within a few hours, uh, that judge was transferred from that area. So do you think in Sri Lanka, judiciary seems to be compromised in a state of a independent arbitration of disputes? It is just taking a side? You see, in every community, in every country, the only um, comfort that an individual community has is for an impartial judiciary. And when the judiciary it shows its bias and, and it's not impartial, then that's a very dangerous sign. And you rightly pointed out some of the countries which have had a, a with, the ju with the judicial system, the judiciary itself has compromised. And it seems, as we have heard, that this was a clear case where the judges, two against one, uh, and one of them was, by the way, the Chief Justice himself. And the dissenting judge made it very clear that he was not happy with the way things were going on. And somehow the police. You're watching Muslim Network TV. 
and uh, we have people from Sri Lanka, London, and Charlotte, North Carolina, and we'll continue our conversation after this short break. Assalamu alaikum. I love Adam's world because it makes me learn in a fun way. That Adam has green, a green face and um, orange hair. I like this song. I like how Adam sings. I like Adam's world because it makes me because it makes me happy. No. 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 And here's Adam and here's Anissa. Adam is and his sister. And Adam is a boy and he is very smart. Download the new Adam's World app at adamsworldapp.com and let's help tomorrow's Muslims today. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and with me is uh, Hilmi Ahmed from Sri Lanka, Sarikbal Sakrani from London, and Faris from Charlotte, North Carolina. So before we get, uh, we took a break, Iqbal Sakrani, you were saying that it seems that the Sri Lankan judiciary is no longer uh, an independent arbitration of disputes. It's, it seems to be the case, um, um, Sab, and that's why I think the new petitions that have been put in have sought for the full bench. And I very much hope that the full bench will be able to hear. And I'm sure there will be within the judges, um, you know, um, there will be people and persons of integrity who understands the damage, not just to the communities in Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka is on the verge of being um, uh, seen uh, around the world as a country who is not really um, uh, showing uh, in terms of issues of justice, natural justice uh, on its citizens, and the issue of discrimination that we have heard from our uh, colleagues early on is, is vibrant there. Um, and it's all, in fact, because of the concerns of the recent elections that took place and the manner in which it was conducted. So there's quite a bit of baggage around the, the dirty political side but under any circumstances, you cannot really denigrate the entire um, a community and the entire faith when such matter arises. Therefore, I'm confident that the international community will take this matter extremely seriously. And we have to establish a very powerful precedent that no country on this earth 
can on its own will able to carry out such drastic, unjust, atrocious measures against any community. It's a human right issue, and I'm confident that the support that we've gained from most eminent lawyers in this UK, including the International Bar Association, who hopefully will be issuing a very powerful statement, and the Sri Lanka government has to come to terms that if they want to stay as part of the international community, then they have to respect international law, international legality, and the basic human right of its citizens and the religious sensitivities of any religious group. This it has to be done, and inshallah, once that is done, we can see a bit more um, an issue of natural justice coming in and back into the normality, which we hope and pray our Sri Lanka brothers and sisters will be able to come in. Sir Iqbal, this, uh, I mean, this whole thing uh, connected with uh, war and terrorism and Islamophobia. Allah I mean, Allah most of it is, uh, I mean, uh, most of it, well, our audience need to hear that that was a call of Adhan. We are coming from three different continents and it's time for prayer somewhere, it seems. Um, uh, uh, Sir Iqbal, I mean, Islamophobia, terrorism, and war, I see that as a cycle pushing each other uh, forward and building on each other. I mean, all these things have started uh, essentially in the West. Do you feel the Muslims in the West has a responsibility to assist the Muslim minorities who are in different parts of the world, not quite uh, ready to handle that these uh, later, uh, I mean, residual part of the, you know, war, terror, Islamophobia cycle, which was first impact was the Muslims in the West, and now it is reaching to Muslim minorities around the world. Uh, do, do, do you think Muslims in the West, a Muslim in America and Europe, has a higher level of responsibility to understand the challenges Muslim minorities are facing around the world and support them? I entirely agree with that. Um, we as Muslims who live in the West, and particularly in the UK, USA, and many of the European countries, uh, do have that huge responsibility. Um, yes, we have. We do bear the brunt of Islamophobia uh, in the West as well, uh, in the UK, in the USA, um, very targeted um, from a particular groups that we see constantly attacking um, Islam and Muslim community whenever any act of terrorism takes place. And you give a very classic example of how the situation in USA on Christmas Day that took place um, uh, 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 in your country. And yet the word of terrorism, or initially the word, it, it's how it is played down. God forbid if there was a Muslim involved or even suspected, we would have seen the headlines around the world and 24 seven about the Muslim terrorist attack taking place in USA. So yes, we do have, and I think, um, um, uh, Imam Malik, I believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a great opportunity. An opportunity for the Muslim communities around the world, not just in the West, to really come together and say enough is enough. We have so far relied so much on our Muslim countries and others to really um, you know, act on behalf of the injustices that have taken place. They have failed miserably. We have seen what's been happening with the Yuga community in China. We have seen what is happening with the Rohingyas, where genocide has taken place in the eyes of the world community. And yet it took us months and months and possibly years before they came to, into place. We see similar situation happening in other parts of the world, the continuous problem of Kashmir, the issues of Palestine, the, you know, the oppression, the great injustice against all international law. This is not where we are seeking any special treatment for Muslims or Islam. We are see, simply seeking the rights as the basic human beings in the world, which are not respected or not adhered to. So what do we do? Are we just going to be the recipients of all this um, mass uh, denigration, insults, um, uh, abuse on our communities? I think time has come now. Time has come where there's a greater understanding with the Muslim community. The more we look into it, only thing that is, of course, required is a greater unity amongst us. I'm confident we have got no exercise to grind. We are not here for any economic benefits against other countries as our Muslim countries are. They've got the economic relations to look at upon. We are independent. Alhamdulillah, we are law abiding. 
We want to act according to the laws of the country in which we live in. There is international law which we want to respect, but we want to ensure there's no double standards. We want to ensure that the one community against the other are not simply being um, uh, let down because of the faith. And this is where our unity between the Muslim organizations around the world need to come together and fight for great injustice that's there taking place against the Muslim Muslims. We've got the most eminent lawyers, we've got the most senior businessmen who are prepared to support us with our actions. This action in Sri Lanka today, the calls that we made to a number of countries, I have been amazed that the, the, the unanimous support, every cause has got some people who have got some reservations, this, that. This cause has got a clear unanimity in the, in the world between Muslims and non-Muslims as well, because it's a huge desecration of the, you know, the, the rights of the people to be buried, which have been desecrated. And that cannot be accepted. So I, in fact, stand that Allah Ta'ala may have given us a test, a huge challenge to all of us. And we can come together with our colleagues and organizations around the world. And our media, like yourselves, need to play a key role. Our Muslim media is now all coming up now. And speaking to a few, you will see tomorrow, day after, PA, Press Association, the Associated Press, Reuters, will inshallah build up the story. Why is it not internationalized? How come that this ghastly story that we are seeing in, in Sri Lanka, not in the international media? I speak to a number of people, they've yet to be aware of it. It's just that I think they are not playing the role, or perhaps there have been other issues. Of course, we know the COVID, in, 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 uh, as far as UK is concerned, of course, our Brexit crisis had overshadowed every other story. But this is a major story that should be in the forefront of the international media, the world over. We need to see Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries all speaking with one voice that if we allow this threat abuse taking place, that tomorrow there will be other countries. And as you rightly pointed out, the issues of uh, working together within certain communities and certain groups. And I'm deeply worried what's happening in India with Kashmir. And this is where the real danger can come in, that the politics will play, they will trample upon our human rights and carry out the great injustices without any voice to speak against. Uh, Faris, uh, you heard about the importance of the role Muslims can play. Uh, Muslims who are in the West and America and Europe. Uh, but Faris, are Muslims in America even aware of what is happening to Muslims in Sri Lanka? I think uh, we don't have, we haven't created a network of to create the awareness uh, to the American Muslims. In a, I think uh, we want to thank you first, actually bringing this on the Muslim TV network and actually they will create some awareness uh, to the American Muslims. And if you look at uh, all of these countries, especially Myanmar, Sri Lanka, you know, West, especially the US is one of the biggest trading partners, right? And we buy a lot of product from Sri Lanka. And, you know, there is a say the American Muslims can, can do and, you know, reach out to the State Department, um, you know, some of these businesses that, uh, who are doing a lot of business in Sri Lanka, you know, these guys can put a lot of pressure to the Sri Lankan government. Uh, if you can create that awareness among the Muslims in, Sri, in, in the United States and also in you know, the Western part of the world. So, so how, what is the size of Sri Lankan Muslim community in the United States are, and what are they working on it to inform Muslim as well as uh, use their influence with the government? Yeah, the, the Sri Lankan Muslim community in, in the U.S. is very small. Um, you know, we have a pockets of Muslim in California and New York and in the rest of the, the, uh, the states are like, you know, few, maybe, you know, 10, 20, uh, not more than that. And especially Muslims among them is, is very small. Uh, if you look at Charlotte, we might have maybe two Sri Lankan Muslims. Right. And it's different in New York and and California and those places. And there's some pockets of Muslims in, in Maryland. Uh, uh, but they are also working with uh, a couple of different other groups uh, to create awareness. And there was a protest organized by the Muslims in New York um, around uh, the UN headquarters uh, recently. Um, they are in the process of doing that. Uh, but you know, I, I don't think it's enough to to get their word out to the American Muslim community. 
Uh, Brother tell me, Ahmad, is it going to help? I'm moving directly on the ground in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Is it going to be helpful if uh, if a interfaith uh, group uh, in America, Christians and Muslim and Buddhist, uh, develop a letter of uh, solidarity with the Muslim community and um, their right for the uh, freedom of religion. Do you think something like that could be helpful? Uh, is the need of the hour. And uh, just writing a letter alone may not suffice. Maybe, you know, they could reach out to the Sri Lankan embassy or the consulates uh, in different uh, uh, states uh, to have a uh, informal or formal discussion with the, the ambassador and uh, the diplomatic staff uh, around them and impress upon them the need for uh, them to respect the burial rights. Uh, that is. Uh, now happening uh, to a certain extent across the globe or in Australia, in UK, uh, in parts of Europe, uh, that, you know, the, the Muslims are coming together. The Muslim diaspora uh, has been created. Tell me this, Brother Hilmi, uh, you know, cremation issue Muslim. is one, and I know it has a huge psychological trauma, and it goes against the basic principle of uh, freedom of religion. But what about if we add one more issue to it, um, allow Muslim full freedom of religion, including uh, uh, burial, staff force cremation, but also allow Muslim to attend uh, the government schools? Because that will touch a whole lot of people in America. You know, even Christians, many times they, they cremate their people. So cremation is not considered, it will be difficult for people to understand the type of trauma, which I understand as a Muslim that Muslim in Sri Lanka are facing because of that. But, but in general, in America, it, you know, well, sheer number of people and all that. So can, can the other issue be legitimately be part of it when people are calling? Uh, of course, you see, Muslims have enjoyed uh, quite a lot of freedom in Sri Lanka if you go around the country, you will see hundreds of mosques and people have had the right uh, to practice their religion. But of course, due to various ideological differences amongst Muslims, uh, there has been some conflict and uh, the government has stepped in. Uh, but you see, this particular uh, issue of cremation, of course, uh, uh, it's very difficult for the majority community to understand uh, that, you know, uh, that there is an Islamic requirement for burial. So that is a challenge you will, we will all face, even globally communicating it. But it is important to uh, <clears throat> stress the point that, you know, it is incumbent on the living Muslims to ensure that there is an Islamic burial for any person who dies, whether it's COVID or otherwise. So uh, I think that is the that is I think the main uh, crux of the uh, argument should be uh, to combine it to other issues. Right, the government might easily get away saying, "Come and look at the Muslim economy." Right, uh, some of the uh, big corporates are Muslims, whereas the majority of the uh, Muslims in Sri Lanka are living below the poverty line. But you know the the public perception is that Muslims are rich, right? Uh, Muslims uh, are exploiting uh, the Sinhala Buddhist because, and making money. So those those issues come up. But if the, the high rate of deaths uh, in Colombo itself, right, proves that, you know, Muslims, uh, majority of the Muslims are living in slums, right, with very, very small houses. The whole family cannot sleep at the same time. So they take turns to sleep, right? Some people sleep in the night, some people during the day, or some people sleep in between. So this is this is reality uh, in, 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 in most parts of Colombo. But of course, if you uh, go to the, uh, for, go for Jumma prayers, 
you will see the most expensive uh, cars parked outside and the best clothing uh, Muslims wear. But you know, even the even the average Muslim uh, sometimes lives slightly better than our fellow uh, countrymen because we do not uh, waste our money on alcohol or gambling. Right. So there is there is more uh, money left over for clothing. So when we when we dress up, they think that you know we are very affluent. So these are issues, social problems that Thank we face. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Hilmi Ahmad. I truly appreciate you coming from uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Truly appreciate that. And thank you, Sir Akbal Sakrani, for your time and your effort. Uh, and uh, we wish you well. And thank you so much, Faris Susan, for being with us from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. And thank you for watching uh, Muslim Network TV. And thank you, Sher Dil Khan and Dr. Abdul Wahid for producing today's show. Muslim Network TV is 24 seven. So stay tuned for other programming. We are on Galaxy 19 satellite, uh, OTT devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Raku. And you can download our app, uh, just type Muslim Network TV download on iPhone or Android anywhere in the world. Our website is muslimnetwork.tv. Thank you so much. Peace and salam. Thank you.